I no, like it's been eighteen minutes since you told me you had to make tea. Yeah, but then I had to spend a bunch of time arguing with you um, and Tom about random things. No, but like, um, but like Richard, I was just sitting here, like I was ready to record on time. Yeah, but it, it's not eighteen minutes from the minute we were supposed to record. It was actually thirteen minutes from the from the time we we're supposed to. Is record. that your defense? Your defense is that you yeah. were only thirteen minutes late. Yeah, that's my. But defense, it's like yeah. it's like one thing if you're like in traffic or like something important is happening in your life, but you were making tea. Dude. No, 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 I wasn't. I was making hot water, with, hot hot water with lemon. To be fair, you were mixing hot water, and it took you thirteen minutes to mix hot water and lemon. Dude, I had to go up. St- we could spend another thirteen minutes talking about what it took me thirteen minutes to do. No, really but like, could. but like, Richard, I'm trying to figure out like how ridiculous you think this is. Like, do you think that this is like normal? Do you think like most people do that, or like? I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, where on the scale from, like, one to, like, how other people should spend their time, where would you rate this? I mean, have you had hot water with lemon? It can keep you from getting sick, which I've been trying to avoid. No, but, like, I sat, here for, I sat here for 18 minutes while you mixed hot water and lemon. Like, we could have been recording. No, because we were supposed to start at one thirty. so. Right, you but know, you got that's... here at one forty three, Which is 13 minutes, not 20 minutes. Okay. We agree on that, right? The math? I mean, we agree that it took 18 minutes from when you said you had to go make tea to when you got on Skype, and of that 18 minutes, it caused you to be 13 minutes late. Yeah, that's right. But, like, is that is that, like, acceptable? Yes. I mean, sometimes you're late. Okay. I'm just, I'm, like, curious. I'm, like, totally fascinated by this. I'm, like... I I, just, I think that, like, a lot of different people, and in particular, like, a lot of different, like, cultures have different views on, like, punctuality, and I'm, like, totally fascinated right now. Tom, I don't think AJ is fascinated. I think AJ is pissed. <laughs> I think AJ is saying he's fascinated, but he's not fascinated. Well, no, I mean, so, like, I'm, like... AJ, this is fake fascination. You're not fascinated, dude. It's okay to say you're not fascinated. No, I'm I'm actually like I actually like I actually am pissed, but I'm more fascinated than pissed. The thing the thing that I it, it, to me is just like so bizarre and otherworldly that like I'm I'm sort of my curiosity is like overwhelmed any sort of anger I have. Well, that's good. Um, this is it, it is uh, so. Speaking of cultures, right now, the at least in like Gujarati culture, if someone is like fifteen or twenty minutes late. That's like just not something or even half an hour late, frankly. Um, it's just not something you really get upset about. It's just sort of like, OK, you know, things happen in life, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Like it's not even a – it's not even a thing, you know? Really? Like it's not even remarkable. Yeah, it's not It's not even something that you would really remark upon because like, you know, there's – things just happen, you know? It could be that there was like traffic. It would be – it could also be that, you know – you could spend as much time arguing about the cause um, and whether it was a justifiable incident or an unjustifiable incident as if you just kind of got on with your life at that moment. Um, maybe that's part of the reason, too, that it's not considered something of remark. But you asked a cultural question, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to answer your cultural question. So, I mean, in a lot of cultures, 30 to 45 minutes is like – it's like literally nothing. And in fact, like in, in Gujarati culture, and if it was, if, if the context was a party, then, you know, if you show up to somebody's house like 45 minutes late, that's actually kind of rude because it's like there's no way the host is actually ready within 45 minutes of the start time. So you should really be minimum hour late. So that that actually I think is true for like most people. I think like Lily and I are people who tend to get to parties on time and one, no one else is there when we get there and two, the host isn't ready. It's a cultural thing, man. It's a cultural thing. The um, people are different as it relates to just sort of, you know, the how big a deal lateness is. It's sort of like – it's like in some cultures, you know, you sit there and you tell the other per- – like, you know, when you're in a, a business meeting, for example, right? You sit there and you tell the other person like – Everything that is interesting and fascinating and great about them or their business or whatever else. And, you know, you just spend 30 to 45 minutes complimenting each other. And that's just sort of – that's the prelude. When it's do you, a, it's a, but when do you do the business? When does the business happen? After that. I'm so fascinated right now. Because the thing is with the, the – bi- a lot of bi- – I mean this is sort of my view a little bit, which is that a lot of business decisions really just come down – to 
the amount of trust that you have with the other person and, you know, what you think their capabilities are. So it turns out that most of the time, not most of the time, but a lot of the time you're meeting with somebody who has good capabilities. So it's not as if they are any more or less capable that, than the other people that you're meeting with. I mean, maybe they are, right? But it, it ends up being a little bit marginal um, at times. It, and so what do you end up doing, right? You try and figure out, like, who's the person that you can trust in a bind. You know what I mean? So, like, when things are going rough and you're going to have a rough year or a rough two years or whatever the period may be, like, who's going to tell you the truth? You know what I mean? Who's going to, um, you know, be respectful throughout that process, right? And that's a lot of what you're kind of trying to to figure out because that's when it'll actually matter. It probably won't matter who's marginally better or worse in sort of normal times. But you're trying to figure out like what will life be like in abnormal times. In many ways, it's not that different from like relationships, right? Um, because like you really – you can meet a lot of people and they can all be great in normal times. But what you're really trying to figure out um, is – what will they be like in times that are not normal? Because there will be times in life that are not normal. I'm so fascinated. So I was thinking that before we start talking about ice and giving our opinions on ice, the three of us make a blood pact on this podcast, okay, where if any one of us is harassed by ICE, the other two agree to do whatever it takes to help the person that's being harassed by ICE. Are you guys willing to make that blood pact? Um, what do you mean whatever it takes? <laughs> like what, what, what could it take? Legal means. All legal means. All so legal means? So filing lawsuits. Filing lawsuits. Um, you know, writing letters. Protesting in the streets. I have a question. So what if so Trump forth. makes it illegal to file lawsuits? Would I still be required to do that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm in. I promise to ask Tom to file any sort of lawsuits it would take to get you out of ICE. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the important thing here is what will... <laughs> Richard, you just stop a for a sip of, of your tea. <laughs> <laughs> you're like in the middle. You're in the middle of something like very urgent to yourself, and then you stop for a sip of tea. Okay, so let's let's actually let's start the show. Let's do the show. I couldn't find a good sidebar. That's what I've been doing while Richard's been talking, but I haven't found a good sidebar yet. No, no, uh, no. We've been talking. We've been in the show. This was the show. No, we've Richard. started the show already. Oh, poor Richard. All right, so let's let's actually do the show though. Let's do the actual show that's going to make it into the edit. What's going on? What's going on in our country? Our country, ICE is, um, there's been a sharp increase in... Immigration and Customs Enforcement. In, for our, yeah, for our okay, listeners. so ICE stands for Immigration and Customs Enforcement. There's been a sharp increase in uh, reports of brutality committed by ICE or harassment committed by ICE. Um, the ACLU is uh, has started keeping a website to track ICE abuses. They have... Um, uh, one of the things that the Obama administration had had been fairly careful about safeguarding is that, uh, you know, there are certain areas where ICE will not seek to detain people. Um, so, for example, they won't be waiting for you outside of the courthouse. Um, the, uh, you know, the schools. There have been reports that, that people have been going to um, immigration offices, Homeland Security offices that, that, uh, that, uh, for for immigration services in order to uh formalize their their residents in the united states and ice have picked them up while they were trying to assert their rights as persons in the united states um there's an article in the new york times there was a yale student who was helping her father uh navigate the immigration system and they uh showed up for a meeting with the government and at the meeting the government said okay we're just going to process some paperwork and you're going to get legal resident status and then the person left the room and then came back in the room and the, the tenor in the room changed and then ice came and arrested this person's father this person's father was like moments away from attaining legal resident status and then instead immigration services arrested this person um uh, in other recent hey, years, aj yeah aj before we go into um more ice news because there's there's obviously a lot of it um I think one of the reasons this is this all of ICE's activities anger me so much is so th it's based on sort of two two sort of um, premises that I come at it with. 
One, which is that immigration's enforcement resources are not unlimited. Okay, so that means you can't go after absolutely everybody. Uh, you know, all the time. It's sort of like police in your city, right? Right. The reason they can't hand out tickets to absolutely every single person for jaywalking is because it's just not a smart use of resources, right? Do you want the police handing out tickets for jaywalking or would you rather have them going and solving murders? You know what I mean? Or solving like, you know, drunk driving or like any of the other thousands of issues. And we all deal with this in our lives every day, right? We can't have absolutely everything that we want. Um, There's tons of things that we would like, but we can't have everything that we want. So, So that's my first premise is that ICE's resources are not infinite. And my second premise is that ICE is an agency that, unlike the tax man, has the ability to, to really, really destroy people's lives. And by that, I mean they can separate families if they so choose, um, where there is a kind of as the example that you talked about a moment ago, where there's a, there's a, a father and a daughter, right? They could separate young children from their parents if their parents came here without documents, right? Um, and the children were born here, let's say. Um, they could separate grandparents from their, from their grandchildren, you know? Um, th- they can do all kinds of things uh, that will that will really ruin people's lives, right? They can take, they can take people that have been in their homes for, for, for years, maybe even decades and send them back to a country that they don't even know or recognize. And so because ice can ruin people's lives, um, my second premise is that they should be very careful about ruining people's lives because this isn't like a jaywalking ticket, right? Where you just kind of go on and, you know, you pay the 80 or a hundred dollars or whatever. And then, you know, life goes on, right? So I, I think they need to – we want any agency that engages in, in this type of behavior where they're breaking apart families to do so with compassion. So one, we want them to really prioritize on the cases that matter, and two, we want them to act with compassion when they do act. And that's the context through which I think we need to, we need to view ICE um, because a lot of people I think I hear, especially in the conservative media, that's like, well, these people broke the law. Right. They broke the law. They, they, they're, they're here illegally without documents, whatever you want to call it. They broke the law. Um, and so I, I want to put that idea of they broke the law in the context of sort of the two premises that, that I've sort of put forward. But but you guys feel free to comment. Sorry, I just wanted to say that. Yeah. I mean, I think that's accurate. Right. So so one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, people um, people who enter this country without authorization are, I mean, first of all, they're people. They are still people. They're entitled to rights. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, exactly what rights they may have. Um, but also, like th- these people are coming from a, a position of like significant misfortune, right? Like these people aren't um, immigrating without authorization because it's like fun or exciting. It's they're not like on an adventure. Right? Like these are people who are seeking relief from from like, extraordinary hardship. Um, and for for those that. Uh, appropriately should be removed from the united states you you would hope to have an appropriate enforcement arm but for for people who are um you know trying to help their dad become uh for, for students at yale who are trying to help their dad become a uh, permanent residence you know that those are that is not the sort of family that needs to get broken up i mean it's not this like right it's not what you would want your government to prioritize but it's also just not what you would want your government to do period right i mean i think i think a little bit of what you were saying is like oh part of my problem with this like conspicuous enforcement is that i want the government to be prioritizing solving murders but like i would like let's say the government had infinite resources i still don't think that this yale family should have been totally i i agree with you i agree with you and i i think what i was trying to say is that if you are a person that thinks ice needs to act aggressively I would say that there are two counter arguments that I would make. One is that they probably shouldn't – they should probably prioritize like you know gang members you know, <laughs> or people who are engaging in like violent crimes. Or secondly, they should at least be compassionate. So whether you think of it as prioritization or compassion, I think you wouldn't behave the way that ICE behaves. And th- that's sort of what – that's what I'm trying to say to people that – who I have heard a lot of um, say, well, they broke the law. That's their problem. You know what I mean? Yeah. Tom, where do you land on this? I mean, you're not going to get much disagreement from me. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, um, you know, I, I think this might be a good jumping point to talk about what rights these individuals have, because I, I hear that argument a lot, a lot too, you know, oh, they broke the law 
and it seems like that's a justification for just about everything that ICE does. It is. It is. That is the justification that you hear a lot. I mean, I've I've heard every time. Nobody wants to engage the should ICE do, do this or not. It's just they broke the law. Okay, so, uh, so I've been like I've been like following with like rapt attention in the case of of um, this this seventeen year old girl who is in custody in, in the custody of the uh, Office of Refugee Resettlement through the use of like a private. Um, through the use of like a private detention center and she was pregnant. She was pregnant when she arrived in the United States, she was picked up at the border and the government said that, um, the government said that they, uh, they, they, they didn't have to help facilitate her getting an abortion. And so she had a guardian ad litem who was appointed by the court system. The, the guardian ad litem helped procure like money for the abortion was going to handle all the logistics. The detention center just had to release her into the uh, temporarily into the guardian ad litem's custody for her to, go and obtain her abortion and the government still said no we don't want to do that it ended up going to uh as high as the fifth circuit court of uh, the sorry the dc circuit and the dc circuit ruled that no the government has to release this girl temporarily from their custody for her to go get her abortion and she's since secured that abortion but the the whole story is like absolutely crazy you know i think it's i think it's sort of uh interesting that the uh there was even there was even a debate like that there was even a debate that these um that people who who are not in the country with with authorization but uh you know are, are being detained by the government the the idea that like oh there there are some sort of constitutional rights that people um that they might not have to me is like totally crazy right i think it comes down to this idea that people that don't have um the proper paperwork there is a dehumanization that goes on, um, I believe, which is that they they are not entitled to the same amount of rights because they broke the law um, regarding immigration, and I, I just don't I don't believe that. I, I believe that everybody is entitled to some minimum human rights. You know what I mean? There's almost a visceral hatred. You know what I mean? That I hear of, and I I don't know where it comes from. If not from like racism or something else, but. I think it gets dressed up all the time, right? It's I, th- I think some people are pretty honestly and blatantly kind of racist about it, but the vast majority of these debates around immigration they get dressed up in in formalities and in uh, legalities, and that bothers me too because it sort of avoids the ethical question altogether. So I mean, so do you do you do you think that uh, I mean, do you think the D.C. Court of Appeals got it right? Do you think I mean, do you think that this that this person should have had a right to an abortion? So what was their reasoning? Because I tell me about that. Because I actually didn't get a chance to look at the case this morning. Okay. So, Tom, did you did you get a chance to look at it? Where do you want to weigh in? I, I, I skim. I mean, basically, the question of whether d- didn't the government concede she had the right to to get an abortion? Yeah. So the government the and that actually is something that the dissent brings up. The government did not put on a case that she didn't actually have a right to obtain an abortion. What the government said is that the government wasn't required to facilitate her obtaining an abortion and it said that the the government was actually trying to help her obtain an abortion by having her placed with a sponsor who could um who could effectively take custody of her and get her uh, out of the office of refugee resettlement's custody and then from there the sponsor if the sponsor chose could could help her get an abortion and so the, the government's theory is twofold first of all we we are not going to facilitate this if she's in our custody and two we're working as hard as we can to get her out of our custody where someone else can can facilitate her getting an abortion and both of the sense uh have different angles for for how they say that uh that this case is is somehow creating a right to an abortion for refugees that one one of the dissents says that um you know, even though the government didn't put on a case that there was no constitutional right for this minor to get an abortion, the um, the 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 court needs to step in and adjudicate this claim, even though neither of the litigants are, because it's such a weighty and important claim. Uh, Kavanaugh uh, basically said that well, the the effect of this decision is to create um, an an uh, an unlicensed right to an abortion or, or an unlimited right to abortion for people in government detention and particularly for minors in government detention um and so kavanaugh's was sort of like from from the ends backwards and the other person uh god i need to find uh judge henderson is the one who said that that the the ju- the court needs to um needs to step in and adjudicate this claim even though the the government didn't put on a case for it that's kind of weird 
Well, I mean, there is some case law on that, right? Like, you can imagine there would be some, like, particularly weighty question of law that the court, you know, should be bound by. Uh, yeah, but I, I, I don't, I, I don't know about that, right? Like, I, you know, it that that usually is, uh, t- you know, issues that goes to the court's jurisdiction, right? Like, it, it's it's going to be very rare, rare where the court sua sponte raises an issue that neither party is is disputing, right? They have an Article Three. Um, obligation under the Constitution only to hear cases and controversies, right? If there's no case or controversy before the court, then the court has an obligation to restrain itself and not, you know, go issuing advisory opinions, right? Um, unless it's a question of the court's own power to hear something, right? If if the parties are, by not having a controversy, are trying to create power that the court otherwise doesn't have then the court has to uh, or the court has an obligation to examine its own jurisdiction right but i i don't think just because it's it's a it's a weighty issue right means that the court has an obligation to to issue an ad- advisory opinion so here here is what uh judge henderson says the Supreme Court has held that if a party fails to identify and brief an issue antecedent to and ultimately dispositive of the dispute, an appellate court may consider the issue sua sponte. Uh, uh, they say uh, that we are never bound to accept the government's confession of error. Here, the question of whether Jane Doe has a constitutional right to an abortion is antecedent to any issue of undue burden. And the antecedent question is dispositive of J.D.'s Fifth Amendment claim. Frankly, I just don't believe that. Uh, I, you know, I, that's pretty, that, that, that sound, you know, like for all the cries of activist judges, that sounds like activism. I mean, I agree with you, you know? Right. So, so like, here's, here's something that the, um, here's what circuit judge Millette said, who was in the, who was in the majority. She said that, um, the government to its credit has never argued or even suggested that JD status as an unaccompanied JD is Jane Doe, um, who's the, the, the woman trying to get or girl woman trying to trying to get the abortion the government to its credit has never argued or even suggested that jd's status as an unaccompanied minor who entered the united states without documentation reduces or eliminates her constitutional right to an abortion in compliance with state law requirements so it sounds like judge henderson that's the argument she was making effectively is that the government's not willing to argue whether or not Jane Doe has a right to a constitutional right to an abortion, but we've got to decide that first. Am I understanding that correctly? Right. I mean, that's that's exactly what Henderson's saying. Hmm. That's weird. Yeah. But what I'm saying is is that you know if it's not an issue of of um uh, uh, uh of jurisdiction or something like jurisdiction that goes to the court's power, then the the court doesn't issue advisory opinions. If the parties don't have a dispute on that issue, yeah, that is really weird. I, I mean, not what you're saying, but it's really weird that the the judge Henderson is is bringing that argument up. The government's not arguing it, and no one is denying that she has a constitutional right to to get an abortion. So, I guess what's the issue? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think that's right. I, I mean, it sounds like maybe this was a. I mean. Was Judge Henderson trying to? It sounds like she was trying to make it an issue. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly what's what's going on. Well, I, I think that I think that every once in a while you stake out a dissent where you just want to talk about whatever it is you want to talk about. I mean, you you can think about that recent um, uh, that recent Supreme Court case where the Supreme Court held that uh, Oklahoma's lethal injection protocol using midazolam was constitutional. And then Judge uh, Justice Breyer wrote a dissent where he was like, well, let's put midazolam to the side for a minute. I actually just want to talk about whether the death penalty is constitutional. Right? <laughs> so, you, I mean, we I mean, we do have experience with in, in, with cases where judges will just sort of talk about whatever it is they want to talk about, regardless of the case. And so this may just be some sort of facial argument to explain why it is she's talking about whatever she wants to talk about. It sounds to me like Kavanaugh and Henderson just don't like abortions. Yeah, uh, looking at at some of the ca- the cases that she cites, these cases go to the constitutionality of uh, of the statute that they're bringing, right? Like, so uh, that they're bringing the lawsuit on, basically a a question of jurisdiction. So here's what she says. Here's what Judge Henderson says. 
The government has inexplicably and wrongheadedly failed to take a position on that antecedent question, on whether there's a right to an abortion. I say wrongheadedly because, at least to me, the answer is plainly and easily no. To conclude otherwise rewards lawlessness and erases the fundamental differences between citizenship and illegal presence in our country. This is sort of the sentiment I was talking about earlier, by the way. The sentiment of, like, rewarding lawlessness. So, but do you, like, do you really think this is about law and order? Or do you think this is, like, what most people talk about law and order? They really just don't like certain people. Right? Like, it seems to me that she's, like, she's much more upset about the idea of this minor obtaining an abortion than she is about, like, a, a, an un, like a, an undocumented uh, person obtaining an abortion. Right? Yeah. She, the integrity of the U.S. border system. Yeah. Like, anyway, so, so I mean, I guess all three of us land on the idea that the government should definitely have released this girl to get an abortion weeks and weeks ago, right? And to be clear, just to release her to get an abortion does not mean that they release her out into the country to be an undocumented immigrant, right? It means they would release her. Right. I mean, she would be released into the custody of her guardian ad litem. The guardian ad litem would be responsible for actually bringing her back mm-hmm. when she's done getting her. I mean, you know, in my mind, this this is, you know, a, a analogous to any medical procedure. Like if she wanted to have a particular um, medical or needed to have a particular medical procedure done either way, um, wouldn't she have the right to go, uh, you know, consult with her doctor? I mean, can can the government just because you break a law? I mean, she, you know, it, was she even a was she? I guess is is found guilty in the immigration context appropriate? Was she? Was she? Well, convicted? it's a civil offense. You, you know actually, I mean? yeah, it's a civil. Well, offense. you know what I mean. Like, yeah, was, I know what you was, mean. Did she have like a finding against her? Right? Like, was was there someone you know, in a presumably neutral magistrate who looked at the facts and 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 said. Some, you know, something to the effect of, yes, you you violated the law, right? But even assuming that that's all the case, right? Like, th- the fundamental question here is, can the government stand in between a person and their doctor um, because they violated a law? So here's another argument that Judge Henderson is making. And this is interesting. Um, she's saying that this the as a factual matter j d the Jane Doe was on the threshold of initial entry. She had not actually entered the country, so here's something she quotes: Aliens who have entered the United States, even if illegally, enjoy additional rights and privileges not extended to those who are merely on the threshold of initial entry. Aliens receive constitutional protections when they have come within the territory of the United States and develop substantial connections within this country. Until then, the Bill of Rights is a feudal authority for the aliens seeking admission for the first time to these shores. And she's co- quoting some like 1945 case, but that's just not true, though. That's just like not consistent with the subsequent precedent. Well, she's talking about – this is what's interesting, and I, I don't agree with her in any instance, but she's trying to make a very fine distinction between people who have set foot like in the United States, like let's say you got to Houston, let's say, versus people that were detained at the border, which it seems factually is what happened to Jane Doe. Yeah, I mean that – but she's she's in she, – she has been detained and in the custody of the government for like months now. Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the 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 implicit reading there is that if, if you were to take Judge Henderson's view, right, then there would be there would be no constitutional rights afforded to people who are detained by the government. Right. Uh, that the government wouldn't be required to, like, have uh, a detention scheme that, like, reasonably accommodates, like, human life or whatever. Uh, you know, like, her reading would would basically just say that the, like the government could just murder her. Right. The government doesn't have to, like, feed her while she's in detention. Uh, yeah, I don't know where she would stand on that. Yeah. And, and that's actually not even true. You know, like if, if you're a um, if you're a, uh, a an, an undocumented person at the border, you still have some rights. Right. Um, I mean, you have a, a Fourth Amendment right for sure. I, I think this is kind of a dangerous precedent avoided. You know what I mean? Like. I think if this had been a majority opinion as opposed to just a dissent, I think it would have very much circumscribed the rights of people that are in this country, you know, um, without documents, whether they've been stopped at the border or not. You know what I mean? 
this is it, and and I think that's like a. There's a, I don't know, for our listeners, I would say that sometimes what the Supreme Court does, which isn't obvious, and not even the Supreme Court, sometimes the district courts will, or the circuit courts will do this too, is they chip away at precedent or they sort of very gradually build new precedent that that, that will then be used by litigants in the future. It's actually fairly strategic, which is not always obvious unless you're kind of looking at this stuff all the time. Can, can I tell you guys a, a story of a case I worked on a long time ago when I was clerking? Yeah, dude. Of course. This is all. I mean, this is uh, you know an issued opinion, so it's there's nothing, you know, confidential or anything like that. Um, but this was a case about a, a United States citizen who entered um, uh, from Mexico um, into the United States with a a minor, right? Customs took them to a secondary pos- uh, uh, processing facility. And, um, you know, they asked her, hey, you know, who is this? And she presented um, her ID and her and she said, this is my daughter. And she said, he, I only have her uh, certificate, right, for what a cer- citizens or uh, ship certificate. And she um, so for whatever reason, I thought, oh, you know, that um, that doesn't sound reasonable. So they took her to, I guess, a tertiary processing area which, let me see if I can find the description of this. The processing area um, was a secure area not accessible by pu- the public, surrounded by a ch- 10-foot chain-linked fence. Um, it, it, was a, it was basically like a trailer that was in, in, at, at the border. Um, they um, handcuffed this lady to a desk, right? The, the room was real small, 14 by uh, 10 foot, um, and, you know, started questioning her, right? Like asking her all these questions, you know, um, you know, who is she? All, all, all this kind of stuff, right? Um, like why, you know, is this really your daughter? That sort of thing. Eventually they got her to break down and, and say, oh, that isn't, you know, it, that it, it's not actually my my daughter. Um, I'm trying to, to get her in into the country, right? Um, so the issue on appeal was whether um, she was uh, under arrest. The government had the gall to argue that under this scenario, she was fr- fr- a reasonable person would feel free to leave. You know what I mean? Like this is like the government that we're dealing with when it comes to these types of issues. Yeah, these these are the arguments that uh, that we'll hear. I mean, and all these things like these are. You know, it's a power grab, right? So, like, anytime ICE can get their way in one of these situations, it just gives them more power the next time, you know? And that's uh, that's pretty troubling to me. I mean, so do you want to know, the, do you want to know some of the background, what's going on here? The, um, the Office of Refugee Resettlement uh, is headed by this person, Scott Lloyd. Trump's nominee to head the office is Scott Lloyd. And here, here's an article from Slate. The article says, Scott Lloyd's anti-abortion crusade may have broken the law. Will he face any consequences? Uh, the headline is, Scott Lloyd must be stopped. I mean, basically, Scott Lloyd, uh, according to Slate, was chosen for his counterculture bona fides, right? He vigorously opposes abortion, et cetera, et cetera. Apparently, he's been... Um, going from from uh, patient to patient, and there there are uh, probably hundreds of girls in ORR's custody who are pregnant, and he goes to each of them. He's been making them go to pregnancy crisis centers, the ones that he's been um, getting special monitoring for them, trying to make sure that they don't want to get abortions. In emails that the government has had to disclose, um, you know, he's been he's used language about trying to find families that will help girl, uh, help these girls, quote, get through the pregnancy. Uh, when one pregnant minor denied abortion access had, quote, mentioned suicide in response, he urged more anti-abortion counseling. Uh, in another email, he advised that a shelter staffer keep a close eye on a pregnant teen in case she began to demand an abortion, which these girls, quote, often regret. You know, the the this is sort of. This is a, like a top-down culture at ORR, right? Like this is um, this is something that I find like totally fascinating. It's, it's fascinating to me how quickly um, that sort of that sort of culture change, um, right? Like I mean, so uh, you know, Trump's only been in office for nine months. Um, let's see. Let me look up exactly when Scott Lloyd became the head of ORR. Um, 
I mean, do you think it it, it is um a, what it, it it's been a culture change or that you know ice has always sort of been like this, but it's been checked in the past by uh from top the top down. So that that's is, what I believe. That is something that that is would be totally fascinating to me. I would be I would be extremely interested to know. Like how much of this is, is like a Zimbardo experiment? Like how much of this is is people who would never dream of abusing another person who are, are in in a very specific environment end up doing it? How much of this is is like a Zimbardo experiment, and how much of this is just that this is what um, this is what the the employees at ICE and ORR et cetera would be doing if they weren't restrained by the presidential appointees? Mm-hmm. I mean, what do you yeah, think? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I it my the the speed at which the change has happened makes me inclined to believe that it's the other way around that that maybe they've always had this sort of culture um and the only thing that's held it in check were the the you know the executive appointees, right? Um because you know it, it, as an administrative agency if they wanted to they could really gum up the works and they could they could decide not to be as efficient as they are they're being in the um the uh the mandates from above so I think there's a little bit of um i mean it's important not to not to to come to some sort of cognitive bias right so what what we're right we're like even even though there's been like a dramatic uptick in these sorts of incidences, you would still say that um you, you you wouldn't know – it would be easy to impute all of these incidences onto the entire organization. It would be easy to say that, that 100 percent of the people at ICE support this because anyone at ICE supports this, right? I mean there, there are there are thousands and thousands and thousands of cases that go through ICE, uh, that, that ICE and ORR and, and the Department of Homeland Security process, right? And – uh, there has been a dramatic uptick in abuses, and it's clearly a systemic and cultural problem for the organization. But you know, this could be ten percent of the organization, right? Like ten percent of the organization could be trib- contributing ninety percent of these stories, right? Like a like a classic eighty twenty rule. Although I did ninety ten, but you know what I mean, right? On the other hand, it really could be the case that this is this is something that the entire workforce at, at ORR and DHS uh, support and think is good. I mean, I don't know that we know from these news stories exactly what the case is. One, well, you know, but my point is is a little different, right? Like, my point is that, um, you know, even if it is just, you know, ten percent or twenty percent are are making all the news, um, some. My inclination is to think something must have checked those ten percent or twenty percent of individuals in the previous administration. Um, you, you know what I mean, like. Um, it it can't it, it it all of a sudden they they feel empowered to do the things that they are doing right and it it's sort of analogous to how uh Donald Trump's rise has empowered certain segments of the the society to do what they're doing now um you know with regard to the racism and 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 um feeling like they they have a a, a voice in society that they maybe they didn't before so I think that's definitely true, right? Yeah, I, I I think it's true of ICE as well. By the way, like I I agree with you, Tom. I I don't think like I don't think you can turn an agency on a dime like this. Uh, you know, some of the stuff that they're doing, like you have to. I I really believe that like if you were in ICE and you didn't want to go break up families and you didn't want to, you know, go like wait for immigrants outside of hospital rooms when they're having like right to 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 meet them before or after they get a surgery. Uh, I, I I think you could get out of doing that. I think you could say, "Hey, you know, I mean, we just we've got these gangs that we're following instead, you know, or whatever else." I think this is something they have wanted to do, especially the people that are doing this and the people that are directing this effort, and they feel that Obama was keeping them from doing it, and those political appointees were keeping them from doing it. But I mean, yeah, I I think this is a this is a very nationalistic uh, organization. You know, and they they have like I'm not talking and, and you know, it's I, I think it's the people that are rounding people up. Right. Like I've gone through Border Patrol, like, you know, Border Control, like, you know, I don't know, a couple of times, I guess, since Donald Trump became president. And it's been nothing if not professional. You know what I mean? I haven't like once felt any different than I would have during, you know, the Obama administration, you know. Uh, so. 
but but I but I think there's segments of ICE that are clearly loving this. One one thing that I think is important to keep in mind is that you know for for all of the hope that like John Kelly would be an adult as as the White House chief of staff that he would be sort of an adult that would temper um that would temper Trump's worst impulses is that John Kelly was the head of DHS before he was the White House chief of staff and John Kelly was was extremely supportive of these redoubled efforts by ICE um you know to disrupt families pick up people at courthouses and things like that I mean John Kelly you know, for for all the things you might say about him, that for whatever you might think that he's better than Ryan's Priebus or 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 Bannon or, or Steve Bannon or, or whoever, is that he, you know, there there are some core tenets of Trumpism that John Kelly is a real believer in, and I think that, um, you know, he got into he got confirmed for DHS almost immediately in January, and I think that that this is something that he was able to turn around in the in in the entire department like fairly quickly. Yeah, I think if John Kelly had been, um, if John Kelly had been, uh, you know, appointed by George W. Bush, he would have been the most radical member of the Bush Bush administration. I think it, I think it's only I think he's only considered adult and um, you know centrist because in relation to like everybody else that Trump has appointed. Well, I think this is I think this is problematic. I think this is something that a lot of people don't know about. I think this is sort of a, an a, a, an arm of our government where Trumpism is proceeding at pace, and it's it's really easy to think about how the tax reform uh, may or may not pass, and that that the uh, ACA repeal and replace is definitely not going to pass. You know, it's uh, the Muslim ban continues to be. Uh, stayed by the courts we're on the third iteration of the muslim ban and the third time courts have stayed it and it's it's sort of it's easy to gloat or to get um sort of confident with respect to the places where trumpism is is not successful but in the sphere of immigration and in law enforcement under jeff sessions and john kelly and uh uh and under uh, scott lloyd you know i think it's it's fair to say that trumpism continues apace and is um is is really preying on the most vulnerable people in our society it's preying on people who are detained by the government who don't have the freedom to defend themselves who depend on access to to their attorneys that the government is not facilitating it depends on access to medical services that the government can can just choose to deny them um you know i think that uh that preying on the most vulnerable members of our society is uh is like sad I think it's a sad thing for our government to be in the business of. It's a sad priority for our government to have. Yeah. I mean, so the, this this uh, this Jane Doe who was, who was trying to obtain an abortion, you know, she was fleeing from an extremely abusive family. She had a sister who had become pregnant in her home country, and, the, and their parents had beaten her until she miscarried. She claimed that she had also been abused by her parents. Um, and the, the government said, well, you know, if she needs an abortion so badly, she can, uh, give up her, any sort of, uh, refugee or asylum rights that she might have and return to her family in her home country. And maybe she can try to get an abortion there and then she'll be out of the government's custody. Um, which I think is just like, it's just callous, right? I mean, I think it's, it's just, it, it, you know, it's, it's hard to say that it's intentionally cruel because, um, that's sort of a weighty thing to say about someone, but if it's not intentionally cruel, it's, it's certainly, um, you know, not for not for lack of effort. I mean, I think I think it takes real work to obtain results that that are so unjust. You have to force yourself to be a little compassionate, right? Um, because that's at the end of the day, kind of what makes you human. It's it's not your it's not your money. It's not your good looks. You know, it's uh, it's sort of how you treat other people and what you think about how the government should treat other people. And so when, you know, you're in favor of someone or some policy that really just abuses people, that's that's just not good, especially when the vast majority of those people being abused aren't gang members. You know, they're they're just families, you know, they're just people trying to make a living um, and, and trying to to live their own dreams. You know, they didn't they didn't steal anything from anybody. They didn't murder anybody. They didn't sell a bunch of drugs. Um or or whatever you might consider objectionable. I mean one one other thing to say about this, probably the last thing that's worth saying about this, is that this sort of uh conspicuous immigration enforcement um is 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 something that's been with the GOP for for a really long time. Uh when Mitt Romney ran in 2012, um you know, he talked about voluntary deportations uh during the debates against against uh, President Obama and people that 
That wasn't so bad, was it? I mean, people people at the time said, "Well, what exactly? What exactly are voluntary deportations? What what would the government actually do in order to obtain voluntary deportations?" And there was there's a strong suggestion that this was sort of voluntary. The voluntary deportation language is is a dog whistle for saying that the government would so scrupulously and ruthlessly enforce uh, any any immigration authority available to it that people would just stop coming or would choose to leave. You know, if if you are an abused minor who is pregnant, that you should go back to your abusive family if it's important enough for you to obtain an abortion that's a form of voluntary deportation right that's exactly what the government told the court that she can she can uh she can give up whatever right she may have to be in the country as a refugee and just go back to her home country she can voluntarily deport herself and then from there she can she can obtain her abortion maybe um and i you know if you if you look at if you look at what's going on in the virginia governor's race where where voting will happen in uh, about a week and a half everybody should um everybody should be following that donating to rob northam etc um the 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 uh, republican nominee gillespie gillespie is uh running these ads that are horribly anti-immigrant and he was supposed to be the establishment candidate and now he's running ads that suggest that all hispanic people in virginia are members of ms-13 et cetera. Et cetera. um uh i think it's just sad right like i think i think this is this is a culmination of something that has been with the gop for a long time yeah, I mean, I think there's been two forces in the GOP on this. So I'll be honest. I never thought of Mitt Romney's voluntary deportation as we will aggressively deport people so that they'll be afraid of being deported and send them to voluntary perhaps, leave. I, perhaps, I mean, that's because, perhaps that's because you're not the dog that he's whistling to. I don't know. Most, I mean, most of the attacks that I heard in response to that were that this is ridiculous. Mitt Romney's weak on immigration, you know? Like that sort of, and then remember the other tenets too, right? Which didn't succeed. So, but at least they were, you know, within Republican thought, where you know immigration, you know, sort of legalization plans um, or plans to at least, I mean, you know, Marco Rubio's plan, which obviously didn't succeed. You know, the strain of John McCain's ideas on immigration. You know, John Kasich's ideas on immigration. So. None of these ideas won out. I'm just trying to say that I, I wouldn't paint it with as broad a brush as you're painting it, AJ. I think that one part of the party absolutely believed in some of the things that Trump is doing and maybe many of the things that Trump is doing. And he's he's been able to do that. But I, I, I wouldn't say that all Republicans believe in this heavy of an approach to immigration enforcement. So – so here's what Mother Jones said in 2012. Uh, there's an article called Self-Deportation. It's a real thing and it isn't pretty. Mitt Romney, um, you know, Mitt Romney started talking about self-deportation during the campaign. And they say, here's what Mike Krikorian of the Center for Immigration Studies, which is an anti-immigration think tank, explained in the concept in 2005. Among the measures that would facilitate enforcement... Um, uh, enabling the government to detain more legal aliens, additional measures to need to promote self-deportation. Unlike at the visa office or the border crossing, once aliens are inside the United States, there's no physical site to exercise control, no choke point at which to examine whether someone should be admitted. The solution is to create virtual choke points, right? The idea is to create... Uh, the objective is not mainly to identify illegal aliens for arrest, although that will always be a possibility, but rather to make it as difficult as possible for illegal aliens to live a normal life here, right? Like, that is that is how the... That is how corners of the conservative movement have understood what exactly a um, self-deportation is. Chris Kobach, the Kansas Secretary of State, who helped uh, – Chris in 2012 bragged, uh, there haven't been mass arrests. There's been a bunch of court proceedings. People are simply removing themselves. It's self-deportation at no cost to the taxpayer. I'd say that's a win. Uh, that's what he said um, – when he uh, he re he had endorsed Romney in 2012, he was talking about restrictive anti-immigrant laws that he had helped um, that he had helped draft in Arizona and Alabama. Right, Chris Kobach, who's now part of the the who, who's now part of Trump's uh, uh, vote suppression panel. Yeah, I guess I didn't understand. I mean, I didn't understand Mitt Romney to be saying those things. And I mean, it, that that there were some people in the Republican Party that found that's what he meant. I mean, sure, I'm sure there were. But but hold on, hold on, Rooch. But like that, you wouldn't understand because you're not the target audience, right? Like that's the point of a dog whistle. Like only the dogs hear it. No, that's not true. I mean, there's a lot of dog yes. whistling going. No, dude, there's a lot of dog whistling going on in this Virginia governor's race, and I get it, and so do you. 
and we're not the target audience. <laughs> but that's that didn't negate what Tom said, right? Like, just because you recognize some instance of dog whistling doesn't mean you recognize all instances of dog whistling. Like, you didn't negate the thing that Tom said. Or it's actually not dog whistling, right? Like, I mean... So what is what does self-deportation mean to you? Like, what do you understand when you hear it? To me, it sounds ridiculous. To me, it's like people will just decide that they want to leave the country. To me, it sounds like Mitt Romney didn't want to actually take a harsh stance on immigration because he doesn't actually believe it. And so he blurted out something. You know, I watched that debate. And... It was a – It was in, he was made fun of like in the conservative press. I remember reading about this. And I remember watching like whether it was Fox News or whatever else um, where people were just like self-deportation. This is the dumbest idea ever. But do you, do you think it's like a coincidence that this, that this thing that is the dumbest idea ever happened to resonate with like a significant segment of the conservative movement? Do you think that's just like a coincidence? Do you think like I don't Mitt know Romney, if it was, do I don't think, know if it was – first of all, I don't know if it was significant. I mean it sounds like it resonated with Chris Kobach. I mean okay. Jeff Jeff Sessions, Jeff Sessions, October of 2016 said Jeff Sessions says Donald Trump is mulling making docu- undocumented immigrants quote self deport. Like, why do you think that specific buzzword keeps popping up? I don't know, man. I mean, yeah, I do actually. Yeah, I do. It doesn't. It honestly, like, it's you found like a handful of instances here, and the. I, I don't know. I, I just – I don't think that most – I think when most people – and I'm just basing this just on what I saw on TV in terms of conservative reactions you know, to this idea. The idea of self-deportation was, was like what does that even mean? Like that sounds stupid. In 2012, I understood self-deportation to mean exactly what we're talking about right now. Like that is how I understood it in 2012. Well, good for you I guess. Um, I mean every conservative outlet that I had ever seen was was – you, you know, universally panning Romney for not being tough on immigration and instead suggesting the stupid idea of self-deportation. Like, why doesn't he just say that he's going to, like, round up a bunch of immigrants, you know? Like, that was a lot of the, the conservative rhetoric. Do, doesn't that sort of prove the point that, that um, you know, they're, the, the Republicans are being a lot harsher on this issue for a longer time than, than you know, that was the original point. I'm I'm actually like this has actually been very interesting to me because it's like it's like interesting to me that like I think there are like huge chunks of the population where like if a dog whistle doesn't land on them then they assume it's not dog whistling right like if I didn't understand that to be a dog whistle then it couldn't possibly have been a dog whistle I think that that is like an interesting perspective to have and I think that that um, that's not what I'm saying I, I that I actually totally... is what you said right. No, I said in this specific situation, I don't think it's a dog whistle. No, but but let me ask an ancillary. Hold on, let me ask an ancillary question. AJ, do you believe that Mitt Romney was intentionally dog whistling? You know, so here's what I'll say. I don't know exactly what Mitt Romney uh, thinks self deportation means. Uh, I don't know if he thought he was dog whistling. I don't know what that is i know that 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 is an idea that had been floating around the anti-immigrant wing of the conservative movement for a long time by by the time Mitt romney is running in 2012 the tea party is a staggering force in the conservative movement and one of the one of the chief goals of the tea party movement is uh is is anti-immigration sentiment right i mean that's how people like like um like jeff flake and and some other folks uh sort of rose to prominence on on the right wing of the gop uh which uh, is is their anti immigration campaigning? Uh, uh, Governor Brewer in Ar- in, uh, in Arizona is another Jeff example. Flake's anti immigrant. Yeah, um, yeah. What 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 does he propose that was that was? Is he anti immigrant like in context of like Trump's views on immigration, or is he anti immigrant in the context of sort of Democratic views on immigration? Fl- well, okay, we're getting sidetracked. Flake was a Tea Partier when he was in the House, so the. The the point that I'm getting at is that I don't know how this specific term of art, this specific piece of jargon, like ca- came to Mitt Romney. I don't know how it occurred to him. I don't know why he chose to say it. But I, what it means to me, right, is is it, it it would be stunning to me that it would be a coincidence that the GOP candidate for president of the United States happened to at the same time that this idea was floating around the conservative movement come up with the exact same name for it and use it in a presidential debate. Um, it would, to me, that would be a stunning coincidence. Much more likely to me is that I think one of his advisors fed him this line. This, this advisor said, this is a way to talk about, uh, immigration in a way that suburban people won't find threatening. And, uh, if, if Mitt Romney knew exactly what it meant or didn't, I have no idea. 
Um, I have no idea what Mitt Romney meant by it, but I think that this was this was an idea that rose to such heights within the conservative movement that a GOP presidential candidate was saying was was talking about it on a debate stage. Um, you know, I think it's really easy to think about presidential campaigns as sort of this this singular force that Mitt Romney had all of the ideas, wrote all of the speeches, came up with all of the jargon. I don't think that's true, right? I mean, there's some advisor that gave him this line, and that advisor got it from someone who got it from someone who eventually got it from one of these fringe sort of Tea Party people. Uh, I don't think it's it's a coincidence that self that this self deportation term of art uh, occurred to Mitt Romney at exactly the same time that it was gaining traction in the rest of the GOP. Breitbart, by the way, has a list of 15 times Jeff Flake represented illegal aliens and foreign workers instead of uh, instead of Americans. Breitbart, huh? Oh yeah, yeah, dude. Breitbart hates Jeff Jeff Flake, dude. All especially all the times he talks about the value of migrant labor and how DACA aliens should not be punished. It is clear at this moment that a traditional conservative who believes in limited government and free markets devoted to free trade, pro-immigration, has a narrower and narrower path in the Republican Party. In 2010, Flake voted against the DREAM Act. Guess he changed his tune, man. Yeah, I, I'm telling you, Jeff, Jeff Flake changed – when Jeff Flake was in the House during the rise – of what was in congress during the rise of the tea party movement jeff flake tacked pretty far to the right right around 2009 2010 2011 uh it is an extremely recent phenomenon that you would think of jeff flake as a, as a moderate uh member of the gop congress i don't know where we started what were we talking about this episode i've completely forgotten all right you want to do supreme court predictions um uh, let's just do let's let's clear our docket let's uh i've got three let's do three okay the first one is about immigration you ready for this this is Jennings v. Rodriguez, and the issue here is do non-citizens have a right to bond hearings in immigration proceedings? So ICE goes around rounding up uh, non-citizens, puts them in, in jail before they um, have, uh, you know, to basically prove that they're a non-citizen before they can de- deport them. Can they hold them indefinitely until that point without any sort of bond hearing? The Ninth Circuit below held that yeah they do have a right to to a bond hearing um what do you guys think it's a pretty simple case but the uh what are the arguments really well i mean the 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 entire issue is you know what level of rights are we giving individual non-citizens who are detained by ice kind of goes to the heart of what we've been talking about yeah how apropos tom i'll send you guys the uh the link to the Ninth Circuit opinion in the Slack. The uh, AJ, do you have any thoughts? Are you gonna? Do you want me to predict? Do you want to predict? What are your, what are your you thoughts? You predict. Oof. I think and hope it will be five four. Uh, Kennedy will write the majority opinion probably. For mm-hmm. against ice. Against ice, indeed. So he will affirm the uh, Ninth Circuit's decision. I mean, I think I think they have the right, right? Do you really think it's going to be five four? It sort of seems like they, right? Like, yeah, it could, honestly, it could be like a six three, right? It, honestly, it, let let me let me let me re- revise. Let me say six three. Roberts is going to write the majority opinion against Dice. Yeah, against Dice. I think Roberts is going to is going to is going to be on that side. I I mean. I think basically, like, I'm so disappointed in Gorsuch. Oh, my God. I feel like Gorsuch is going to write, like, I don't know. He's going to write some dissent. Um, and it's going to be, like, it's going to completely misstate the law, probably misstate the facts. You know what I mean? But it's going to be effortless, which you really can be when you don't have to worry about the law or the facts. It's really easy. Don't you have to, like, have expectations to be disappointed? <laughs> like how did you have expectations for Gorsuch? You know, I had some expectations, which was just, you know, I'd read some of his opinions in, in you know, when he was a 10th circuit court judge, you know. He's you know, and and you know, he also he also wrote like now this stat was a little bit loaded, but he you know, he had been in sort of unanimous decisions some high percentage of the time. That you know, at the circuit court level, like the vast majority of decisions are, you know, if you want to call it unanimous, unanimous, right? Like, yeah, you know, there's all there's there's only going to be a certain number of uh, 
of of fiery dissenting opinions. True. And it's nowhere near as much as it it is at the Supreme Court simply because, you know, they the circuit courts have to they're a court of last resort for the vast majority of cases, right? Like yeah. they 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 don't have discretionary yeah, um, they have discretion to hear. to hear appeal. They they have to hear it no matter how bad the appeal is. Yeah, it's true. All right, that one was short. Let's do another one. Wait, but you AJ, didn't did predict, you predict anything. Oh yeah, I was hoping not to. Uh, how about? I'll I'll agree with Richard. Five four that the right does exist. No, I, I'm six three now. Five four. Oh, you're I'm six, six three? three. All right, I'm gonna say yeah, six I'm three. I'm six. No, I'll say five four. Then we yes. can be different. Five four. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna say nine zero oh for ice. Whoa. Wow, for ice. Yeah. How yeah. come? Just because. Uh, What's um, your reasoning, uh, Tom? That's shocking. Yeah. Uh, because I know how much the Supreme Court likes to bust the um, the Ninth Circuit. Um, I know that uh, you know. I, I I think you know. There's there's more likely than not. There's a chance that they'll hold that um, they have a right to a bond hearing. But I think I think they're going to set their own sort of rules and and regulations on what that is, and and they're going to to vacate and reverse the ninth circuit sort of decision on that oh that wait sense? tom's persuaded me um i, I i'm sticking i'm sticking with my uh so I, here's I the question right wrong. the question that tom posed is do they have a right to a bond hearing and tom's like oh i think they do have a right to a bond hearing and i think the court will say they have a right to a bond hearing and i still think the ninth circuit is going to get reversed and i know anyway and i think that's like right like th- that's one of the like binary ways where our predictions are are sort of Right, like you can actually get the law right and still end up with with a wrong prediction on reverse versus affirm. Tom is having his cake and eating it too, like a true Supreme Court justice. I am a little bit. I am a little bit. Um, you know. Um, do you guys want to do another one? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, let's do one more. One more or two more? Uh, one more. Because I got two more to do. Uh, Jonah's awake. How much? How quick is your one? Oh, actually, we need to do sidebars. Maybe we should just do sidebars. <laughs> okay all right let's just do sidebars uh, all right i got a sidebar it's extremely partisan um the uh buzzfeed this is like a, this is like a, actually a fairly old story buzzfeed did a story where they had access to milo yiannopoulos's personal emails and milo yiannopoulos was a uh contributor to breitbart he was their like tech editor he um i guess is like fairly famous as a right-wing provocateur and he um so they had access to his personal emails. A lot of those emails were sent to and from Steve Bannon. And what they found basically is that, uh, you know, the they created a, an ad hoc system where Milo Yiannopoulos would purposefully seek out feedback from um, right wing, uh, like neo-fascist people. And um, he would be sort of the liaison between BuzzFeed and fascist movements. And that way, BuzzFeed could sort of claim this like sort of plausible deniability when people would accuse them of of uh, sprouting the ideas of like right wing neo fascists. Um, so it's like how a, did they get access to his email? You know, it's not clear to me how they got access to his. email. Was it hacked? Was his email hacked? I bet it was hacked. Um, it's possible that it was hacked. Sounds like it was hacked. Um, but anyway, this is like a real like stunning insight into like how Steve Bannon works and people remember when like Steve Bannon first got into the white house and there was this question of like, Oh, does he like really believe this like third ter- fourth turning thing? Does he like really believe that the war of like Trumpism against like decency is a sort of like existential fight for the, for the future of the country? And the answer it is, is like, yeah, like he actually, I mean, at least in like his emails to Milo, he like really does seem to think that that's the case. You know, like he really thought that like Milo Yiannopoulos was like going to get on YouTube and and aggravate liberals and somehow that was going to like bring about some sort of like anti-immigrant revolution in the United States. How far-sighted is Steve Bannon? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's brought it on. The revolution is on. You know, I guess it's like. I guess it's like pretty stunning, right? Anyway, so that's my that's my sidebar. It's like a fairly long read. It took me like two sittings to get through the whole thing, but it was worth it. Uh, you should really think about reading it. So my sidebar is Planet Hunters. Uh, so I was at this conference in uh, Boston last week, and one of the speakers was a uh, scientist. I believe she's from, I don't know, from MIT or one of those schools. Uh, and so she was talking about exoplanets. And so for people that don't know, exoplanets are basically planets 
that that rotate or or that orbit around a sun that is not our own. So obviously, there's millions of stars in the world, um, and there are probably millions and millions of planets. But what Planet Hunters is is a it, it's a feed of satellite data from the Kepler satellite, um, which is out there looking at undiscovered planets. And so what Planet Hunters does is it allows you to it teaches you basically how to read these like telescope readings uh, that are coming from the Kepler satellite and to identify planets. So you can help identify planets for researchers to then go look at um, to, with the goal being to find um, not necessarily life, but at least to find planets that are hospitable to life. So anyway, that's, uh, that's planet hunters and that's my sidebar. Cool. 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 Um, my sidebar is, uh, this link where this individual analyzes, uh, how much would an iPhone X, which is the new Apple, Apple iPhone that is being released like what, two days ago or you could order. Yeah. So technically it's, it's released November 3rd, but it was available for order yesterday on October 27th. So, so um, it, the, the, this link goes through how much would an iPhone, if implemented via the technology of 1957, cost in 1957. And they, you know, go through some technical stuff, but the, the, the bottom line is it would cost $150 trillion of today's dollars Wow! Um, to create an iPhone X in 1957. Um, and it, I, you know, one of the reasons I, I, I brought this is just, uh, because I know that, uh, Ruchet likes to troll AJ and I about how Apple has malicious intent in, um, no, its iPhones not malicious to, uh, intent. No. Yeah, dude. No. What do you think planned uh, obsolescence is? The planned part is the intent. Wait, Rich, do you really believe in the planned obsolescence thing? Oh yeah, totally. Wait, really? Totally. Oh, yeah. My oh yeah. I didn't know that. Like, That's I, amazing. I, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Apple is He's just the, trolling us. No, 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 no. I'm not. I'm not. I, I really believe that, that Apple designs products to be obsolete in two to three years. I think it's a critical part of their business model. Are you kidding? Absolutely. No, dude. Wow. No. I had no idea. Any, any, anyone that uses their iPhone 6, just see how well it works right now when you upgrade to the latest software. Just see how well it works. It's going to work terribly. And you have to upgrade for security reasons, right? Um, and... Uh, your phone's going to slow down tremendously, and what's that going to make you do? It's going to make you buy a new iPhone, whether you feel like you need it or not. Really? I'm in this position. This I have amazing. an iPhone 6. I, th- I think this iPhone 6 is great. It works great for me. Um, but, you know, it's starting to slow down. Why is it slow- starting to slow down? I don't know. Why? Uh, yeah, you don't know, and therefore uh, it must be planned as uh, obsolescence. And, and not just that. Um, whenever I upgrade, <laughs> which I have, whenever I have, and I've upgraded the software, and the software slows it down. It does. And then eventually it gets you to this point where it becomes, like, intolerable, and then you have to get a new iPhone. Even though your your current iPhone, you know, when you got it, was perfectly fine and it, if, if they just hadn't messed with it after that. But they did, and uh, <laughs> and so it becomes obsolete. You know, yeah, dude. planned obsolescence. I mean, I'll just let the listeners decide whether they want to believe the guy who can barely work Skype. You know, pulling a Bill O'Reilly like Rucha did here, dude. It's an insult to tell people they're pulling a Bill O'Reilly, okay? Because pulling a Bill O'Reilly doesn't mean what it used to mean, Tom. Yeah. Now pulling a Bill O'Reilly <laughs> means means that you sexually harassed like you know close to a dozen women, if not more, and paid out no, dude, tens that... of millions of dollars in settlements. So no, I, I, I think I that's called offense. pulling a man. No, I think that's called pulling being a man in in media. No, I so here so here's what's actually happening, right? Like, these. <laughs> The, I mean, do you want to hear it or like, do you, do you just, would you rather just go on believing, you know, without it, that, that Apple has these malicious plans for your iPhone? Go, t- tell me what's actually happened. I mean, if that's what you want to do that, you can, you can do that. No, I, I'm just saying, I, I'm, I'm telling you that. I know what you're saying. Okay, I know what you're hit, saying. Hit, hit me with what you're saying, Tom. No. Okay. So, I mean, you understand what the fact that they're packing an entire computer into, you know, what is essentially a tiny little box, right? Totally. Like, 
like how amazing that is, of right? Of course like I the, do, just dude. Just the marvel, yeah, like the of marvel I of, do. Uh, uh, right? Like so, it, when when with every model, like with the starting with the original iPhone, um, you can only pack so much, like battery constraints, heat constraints, yeah, right? Totally. Like you you can only have a processor that is so fast, right? Yeah. Um, and the the so the hardware limitations of an iPhone have always been limiting the software capabilities that humans have, right? Because we have the the software capability to do a lot more than even what an iPhone X can presently do, right? And that the reason is that we have that software capability to do a lot more than what an iPhone can do is because we've had computers for a lot longer than we've had and we've had more powerful computers for a lot longer than we've had iPhones, right? So each iteration of the iPhone has always tried to maximize the hardware limitations using software, right? So when you have a new version of an iPhone that improves its hardware capabilities, the software is, of course, going to try to maximize the hardware limitations that it, it, is, it is constrained by the, the, the iPhone, right? That is the nature of iter, it, iterative technologies, right? Um, it's, it's not some grand scheme by Apple to, you know, uh, make you, you know, make your old iPhones die. It's just the nature of trying to squeeze out every, you know, er, every sort of advantage or benefit you can get out of an iPhone that you can possibly get out of an iPhone with the, the limitations that the hardware presents. Does that make sense? Like it, it you know, it, it, it's it, when you upgrade your, your, uh, iOS to the, the latest software, what, what they're trying to do is, is they're trying to do a lot more with what was only previously an iPhone six or an iPhone seven. But why are they doing that? Because it's making my phone suck because they want, they, because there is a, there is, um, uh, pressure do you know what I mean uh, there? From their shareholder. Yeah, no, I do. It, there's pressure from the shareholders. There's pressure from the media. There's pressure from the public for to their make my iOS suck? system. No, for their, for their iOS to have new features, right? To have new, you know, bell, bells and whistles, right? To do new things, right? You understand that, right? Tom, I'm in, I'm in complete agreement on all of those points. Here's, here's my question. Why are they... Why are they tying security upgrades, which are essential, right? Because nobody wants to have an insecure phone, um, to all of these other things. Um, when they could just give me, they they could just give me the security upgrades because you know there are many upgrades that you'll see all the time, right? Which are security in nature. Um, when they could just give me the security upgrade, and then my phone wouldn't have to be so damn slow. The the reason is so what what it, what it, you'd base what you're basically advocating for is them to create two branches of software right one branch of software for the iPhone sixes one branch or three branches one branch of software for the iPhone sevens and another branch for the eights and X's right um, the the reason you you that's inefficient you should avoid I that. that no 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 it's not just inefficient it's also a security risk right like you, it, the more branches of software you're maintaining the more likely that the more assumptions you have to make the more security holes there are going to be um i mean that's just the nature you know like if you it, the, it, the the less code you have to maintain the less likely it is that you're you're going to run into to um security problems that that's just you know no, I, I get that. I get that. But do, but do you do you agree that whether Apple's intentions are nefarious or not, the effect of their um, giving me a massive piece of new software that my phone that we all agree my phone is incapable of running, uh, they certainly know it's incapable of running it. Wait, uh, Rich, are you about to argue that maybe this planned obsolescence isn't actually planned? Oh, it's planned. I'm just saying. Do you agree that? Do you agree that it makes? Do you agree with the obsolescence part of the planned obsolescence? No. Do, um, do you agree I, that I, Apple's I, updates make my phone uh, obsolete? No. Whether I, they plan to or a, not. I think there's a. I think there's a confluence of factors that that causes um, a 
you know, an old phone to, to run slower. And a lot of it really, I, I think the, the majority of the, the, the cause of, of maybe the slowdown is, is the type of applications you have running on your iPhone, right? Like, um, is it a, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I hate to say user error, but a lot, a lot of times it is user error, you know? I, I would go a step further. I would say a lot of it is psychosomatic. What's your definition of obsolete? Like, doesn't it still work? Like, does it still do the stuff you need to do? Not not with the type of speed that I need it to be done, right? If I have to sit there and wait, like, you know, I don't know, 30 or 40 seconds for Google Maps to open, that's, that's obsolete, dude. I, the idea to me that Apple is intentionally slowing down their, their hardware, right? That they're releasing software where they were like, oh, we could program it to be faster and we're choosing to make it slower so that people will buy new phones. That sort of conspiracy theory, right? That there's some guy out there who's like, press the slow switch, like make sure you compile it to go slow, right? Like make sure <laughs> make sure you like insert periods of time where the phone could be working but isn't so that people will buy new phones, right? Like, like the actual like core claim of planned obsolescence, right? That Apple intends for its phones to be slow so that people will upgrade it to me is like a conspiracy theory. Like you may well be saying that like Steve Jobs shot JFK, right? Like, you know, you could say that Apple is, um, you could say, right. Like you could say that Apple is ambivalent about how its software performs on older devices. You could say that Apple doesn't intentionally deliver good experiences to, um, to people with older hardware. Um, I think those claims are false. I think that, um, you know, Apple, uh, it's in Apple's best interest to do the best they can for all of their customers. But the core claim of the planned obsolescence argument, the core claim that Apple is doing it for the purpose of getting people to upgrade, that they are planning for these devices to be obsolete on a schedule in order to encourage people to upgrade, that core claim, I think, is a bizarre conspiracy theory. I think you should, I think you should cover your head in tinfoil when you use your phone if you believe that. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think it's that extreme. Um, but... Uh... I mean, listen, it's definitely not a, uh, it's not something Apple's admitting to for sure. Uh, the, I, I, I don't think it's that crazy of a conspiracy theory, but you know, the, uh, we can, we can beg to differ on this issue. Do you think Apple has like a, has like a team of engineers and they like sit there like compiling their software and timing, timing <laughs> the response? Like, Oh, like Google maps no. is loading too quickly on the iPhone success. We need to slow things down to get more upgrades. Like, do you think they have like meetings where they talk about that? Yeah. Listen, listen, AJ, there's a, there's a wait API. There's a wait API <laughs> for the iPhone sixes, right? No, he, I it's mean, super easy. All you got to do is, you know. Wait, no, Tom's I mean, doing a funny not... joke, then you can answer it. No, this isn't funny. <laughs> no, it's the, all right. No, the... I'm just trolling, trolling no, Tom was... no, the That was actually pretty funny. The... No, I mean, the. Uh, I don't think they need to. I think it's, it's, it's just a, they know it's going to slow down the iPhone 6s. And at the very least, they don't care. And I guarantee you that there is some document somewhere um, where they're talking about how one of the ancillary benefits, if not the ma- one of the big benefits of doing it this way, is generating additional sales. I guarantee you they have researched this fact. I guarantee you there is a smoking gun type of document, as there was with McDonald's. 